that's actually, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna start by giving a shout out to Assemblywoman Becky Seawright and Councilperson Keith Powers, who's here, because you're both, you're, this makes so much happen. Okay, great. Good evening and welcome. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the great privilege of serving as president of the extraordinary Hunter College. It's an honor and pleasure to welcome you, joined by Harold Hoser, the Jonathan Fanton director and the entire Hunter community to this very special celebration, the 75th anniversary of Roosevelt House as Hunter's glittering crown jewel. Here, history was made, generations educated, and diversity celebrated. And here, in that very same spirit, today's Hunter College students again gather to learn and engage, inspired now as then by the two extraordinary Americans who once lived here, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. If these walls could speak, and sometimes we almost imagine that they do, they would echo the commitments that Franklin and Eleanor personified to secure and preserve dignity, equality, and opportunity for all, regardless of race, religion, or circumstance. Franklin and Eleanor spent a quarter of a century here, beginning in 1908. Franklin's larger-than-life mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt, built these twin homes as a Christmas present to the newlyweds. But when Franklin and Eleanor opened the gift, in a sense, they found Sarah inside. <laughs> she not only occupied one side of the house, she soon broke down the barriers between the two. As Eleanor later put it, her mother-in-law made herself at home in her part of the house for the next 25 years, sometimes, quote, at the least expected moments. We call it the first New Deal. <laughs> Here, FDR and Eleanor raised their children and launched their careers in public service, destined to rescue the nation and inspire the world. This house served not only as the birthplace of national recovery under FDR, but also as the incubator under, for Eleanor's lifelong devotion to human rights. Here, FDR summoned the courage and resilience to recover from the crushing disability of polio. Here, he rose again so he could lift America from its knees in the wake of the Great Depression. As one of tonight's historian guests, Jeffrey Ward, has so beautifully described in his book, a first-class temperament. From the, in the second floor par parlor hearth, Franklin delivered a reassuring talk to an anxious American people the day after his 1932 election, broadcast live on radio. It was, in a sense, his first fireside chat. From this same home base, Eleanor found her calling, at first in service to the neediest New Yorkers. That modest effort launched a career that culminated decades later in UN passage of her crowning achievement, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and her own emergence as First Lady of the World. As our historian guest, Blanche Wisen Cook, Hunter Class of 1962, has chronicled in her definitive Eleanor Roosevelt biography. And Blanche does a very mean Eleanor imitation, so please find her at dinner. <laughs> We are powerfully reminded of this twin legacy each and every time we gather here. In perpetuating it, we remain committed to bringing people from all backgrounds together for public discussion, faculty engagement, and an education in the Roosevelt spirit. Let me talk a bit about the anniversary that brings us together tonight and the history that led to this anniversary. Franklin and Eleanor left this house for the White House in March 1933 after the building served for four months as the headquarters for the presidential transition. During that time, FDR asked Frances Perkins to become the first woman ever to serve in a presidential cabinet. How perfect for that stubborn glass ceiling to be shattered in a building that would later become the heart of one of the nation's first colleges for women. In the library upstairs, Perkins said yes on one condition, that Roosevelt agreed to expand to the federal level the program they had launched on a state level in Albany. Yes, this is the very spot where Social Security was born, and soon thereafter, where the threads were first woven to construct what ultimately became the country's social safety net. Though engulfed in the battle for economic recovery in Washington, the Roosevelts found time to return to the House in the fall of 1933. 
Reporters gathered outside as FDR eased his, her, his way downstairs en route to a public appearance in White Plains. This photograph was snapped by the Daily News that day, but never published because the president's leg braces could be seen peeking out from his shoes. By mutual agreement, FDR's disability was neither discussed nor portrayed. A very different day. Sarah would live here until her death in 1941. The following year, the grieving president decided to put the building up for sale for all of $60,000, surely the real estate bargain of the 20th century. Franklin and Eleanor had already forged enduring commitments to one potential buyer, Hunter College. For one thing, FDR had provided New Deal funding to build our Art Modern building on Park Avenue, one of the public work projects that another of our special historian guests, Robert Caro, has described in his seminal work, The Power Broker. FDR cut the ribbon at the 1940 dedication of what is now known as Hunter's North Building, where a talented Hunter College junior sang the national anthem. Her name was Regina Resnick. Above all, it was Eleanor, a constant inspiration, Regina said, and as she was to so many other Hunter students, who enjoyed a long and truly special connection to the college. While the family lived here, Eleanor developed a strong bond with Hunter President George Schuster and with the Hunter students too. She often met Hunter girls in the college library or in the offices of the student magazine, The Echo. She rooted for the college basketball team. She made public appearances on campus, spoke at our 1942 commencement, and was even known to bring hungry students home to enjoy her culinary specialty, actually the only thing she could cook, grilled cheese. <laughs> In 1941, Eleanor and President Schuster cooked up something else, the plan to acquire 47 and 49 East 65th Street for Hunter College, and at a reduced rate. At Eleanor's urging, and we know how persuasively she could urge, FDR not only cut the asking price by $10,000, he also kicked in a $1,000 contribution to buy books for his old library, the same library where he and his brain trust had met to plan the dramatic first 100 days of the New Deal, as another of tonight's historian guests, Jonathan Alter, portrayed in his wonderful book, The Defining Moment. Hunter formally acquired the twin townhouses the following year. In its new incarnation, it would be named for Franklin's mother and serve as a gathering place for Hunter students, as well as headquarters for Hunter's house plans and social clubs. Above all, it was an interfaith house where Jew and Gentile and women of all races sat at the same table. Not only a Roosevelt family tradition, but a commitment to access inequality that we trace back to our founder, Thomas Hunter. The Roosevelts enthusiastically endorsed the plan. And so, following some touch-ups for the home's new life as a campus center, the college planned a gala opening for November 1943, exactly 75 years ago. Now, not everything went as planned. Something happened between Sarah's death and opening day, World War II. On the day of the big ceremony, FDR could not join us. He had an awfully good excuse, though. He was steaming across the Atlantic aboard the battleship USS Iowa en route to Tehran for an Allied summit with Churchill and Stalin. But Roosevelt did send both a message and Eleanor. Speaking before 2,000 guests in the Hunter Auditorium, the First Lady beautifully described the family's experiences and expectations for the new Sarah Delano Roosevelt Memorial House for Interfaith and Interracial Tolerance. Quote, no houses have a better background for the use they will now serve, she declared. Always in both houses, there was an effort to look on all human beings with respect, to have a true understanding of the points of views of others. And she added in her popular My Day column, I think my mother-in-law would have been interested in having work go on in these houses, which will bring about greater understanding and tolerance in young people. Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia seconded that emotion on opening day, noting that New York had made real progress in fostering racial and religious harmony. 
the little flower predicted that the city's progress towards interfaith and interracial understanding as manifested at Roosevelt House would become the means of, quote, conquering hatred, prejudice, and ignorance. Then Eleanor read aloud the deeply personal message that the president had asked her to communicate to the Hunter audience. It reflected the overpowering emotion FDR must have felt even from a battleship thousands of miles from his one-time home as it was being rededicated to his family's ideals. Tonight, we ask a special guest to reread it, just as FDR might have recited it had he been able to attend the 1943 ceremony. He's the perfect choice for the role as he is not only an extraordinary actor, but also the voice of the Roosevelt era in the audiobook version of Doris Kearns Goodwin's new bestseller, Leadership in Turbulent Times. Fresh from the acclaimed production of Uncle Vanya at Hunter's Frederick Lowe Theater, please welcome Jay O'Sanders. Thank you. Um, the, um, when I first got the call from Doris to read the, the um, section of the audio book, by chance, my wife Diane and I had just, uh, just returned from spending two days up at Hyde Park and immersing ourselves in every bit of that museum and the house and, and all of the thoughts and had been to Valkyll not long before. Um, so I thought it was appropriate and I'd just been listening to various recordings of him, the Voice of America, uh, or rather the Voice of America, the, the, um, the you know what I'm saying, the, the, the uh, Fireside Chats, thank you. Voice of America is a very, rather a different thing and I don't want to get that. Uh, the fireside chats and that, and the sound of his voice over the radio that would come down like that and seem so uh, powerful, but also a bit of a remove. So forgive me if I reach for his voice tonight, not the fireside chat, but something that sounds far more like him than like me. I feel that my dear mother would be very happy in the realization of plans whereby the old home in East 65th Street, with all of its memories of joy and sorrow, is now to become Interfaith House, dedicated to mutual understanding and goodwill among students matriculating in Hunter College. It is to me of happy significance that this place of sacred memories is to become the first college center established for the high purpose of mutual understanding among Protestant, Jewish, and Catholic students. I hope this movement for toleration will grow and prosper until there is a similar establishment in every institution of higher learning in the land, the spirit of which shall be unity in essentials, liberty in non-essentials, and in all things, charity. In that spirit, we should all treasure in our hearts and souls the admonition of the grand Old Testament prophet, what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Very sincerely yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. That, that is about the best anniversary present, so thank you, Jay. And as those words foretold, Hunter has spent the 75 years since Dedication Day working to live up to FDR's hopes and dreams for this house. During and after World War II, Roosevelt House took its place as Hunter's mainstay, representing the best of American diversity and democracy at a college dedicated to access and opportunity and to making the American dream come true. We tend to forget what this stately house meant to students who had never been in such a state setting. As Irene Swartz, class of 1946, later remembered, it was very elegant, much more so than a lot of the homes we came from. It was a special place to be. Students formed lifelong partnerships here, 
like our beloved alumna Joan Grabe, who is courted at Roosevelt House to use the parlance of the day by her future husband Bill, who came down for the Bronx. They returned just a few years ago to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. We were not able to find a photo of the Graves renewing their vows upstairs in the Gilder parlor, but we found this shot of them with another spiritual leader when the Dalai Lama visited the house. <laughs> Hillel operated here too, under the leadership of a woman whose son would later lead the New York Times, Toby Lelyveld. Country's first African-American sorority convened here. Downstairs rooms were used for dances, upstairs rooms for study groups, discussions, and meetings. The house echoed with laughter, music, ideas, and plans. Alumna Josie Levine, class of 1964, remembered, my girlfriends who were other ethnicities dragged me off to their meetings and I dragged them off to mine. The fact that Mrs. Roosevelt had lived there, that the president had lived there, that this was a house where they had thought these wonderful thoughts and planned careers, to me, that was like touching history and having history touch me. The house inspired students from all over the world. Indeed, one refugee from South America by way of a war-torn Europe recalled learning English just by spending time at Roosevelt House, listening to hunter girls chatting and debating. For her 80th birthday three years ago, Eva Castingrove's family endowed a transformative student engagement program at Roosevelt House so, the, so today's students would be similarly inspired. Eva, the Grove programs are the gifts that keep giving. And tomorrow, this Hunter girl will turn 83. So please join me in thanking Eva Casting Grove and wishing her a happy birthday. <laughs> Robbie, I know I think of mom when we have that Hunter expression. You could always tell, tell a Hunter girl, but you can't tell her much. <laughs> <laughs> For the remainder of Eleanor's life, to the enormous enrichment of generations of students, this inspiring woman could simply not stay away. One of her visits to Hunter in 1942 with a president of the senior class, a Bronx girl named Bella Savitsky, sat on stage wearing a hat in tribute to the first lady's fashion style. As we all know, hats became her own trademark when she burst onto the political scene years later as Bella Abzug. Eleanor often returned to Roosevelt House itself, beginning just a week after dedication day. As Lucille Friedberg, class of 1944, recalled, quote, I remember her standing on the lower level, and I was on the second level, and she was probably taller than I, even though she was a full floor below me. But she, <laughs> but she seemed so huge to me because of her brain as well as because of her stature. Then there was the young Rita Abrams, class of 1954, who met Eleanor at Hunter II. She felt the same overwhelming sense of awe in her presence and ended up working for the former first lady as an assistant. When Rita's father resisted her yearning to go to law school, Eleanor wrote him a letter urging him to let her pursue her dream. What followed was Harvard Law School, a groundbreaking career at the UN, and her visionary support for the mission of Roosevelt House. Rita Hauser is now the chair of our board of advisors and one of our most generous and inspiring friends. And Rita, I want to say a special, special thank you to you. As Rita and our other founding supporters, like the wonderful ambassador Bill Vanden Heuvel, who is also here, so well remember, age, wear and tear, and lack of funds for maintenance ultimately caught up with this century-old structure. The Sarah Delano Roosevelt Memorial House fell into painful disrepair. The roof leaked. The stairways could no longer be used. In 1992, the house was deemed unsafe, and its doors closed and remained so for well over a decade. When I arrived as Hunter's president 17 years ago, the fate and future of this building was by no means certain. It could have gone either way. The entire city university system was struggling to regain its standing. Hunter recommitted itself to academic excellence as a first priority. There were many who thought Roosevelt House a discardable relic and not a high priority. But we truly believe that this building represented Hunter at its best and most ambitious and was not only worth preserving but reconceiving. We were convinced that the transformation of Roosevelt House could represent and spur the renaissance of Hunter College. 
So in 2002, with the financial and emotional support of so many of you here tonight, we commissioned the architect Jim Polshak to reimagine this building and successfully secure $24 million to restore it. We are so honored that Jim Polshak is with us tonight. Where is Jim? Is he here? Yes, Jim. <laughs> Jim, we thank you for this room, this renovation, this vision, and this celebration that truly could not have happened without you. Under Jim Polshak's leadership, we carved this very auditorium out of old basement kitchens, transformed maids' rooms into scholar suites, parlors into classrooms, and libraries into meeting rooms for students and faculty. The architectural details were lovingly preserved and the Roosevelt legacy respected and perpetuated. Eight years ago, on November 15, 2010, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon cut the ribbon for the new Roosevelt House. Roosevelt House reopened as a public policy institute with curricular and programs charted and led by the extraordinary Jonathan Fanton. We are so delighted to welcome home this founding father of the modern Roosevelt House. Jonathan, please take a bow. We thank your, your very strong partner, Faye Rosenfeld, who's with us tonight. And we want to add a special thank you as well to my longtime partner in crime in this and so many other endeavors, the former Hunter College provost, who now serves the entire city university system as interim chancellor. Please welcome home Vita Rabinowitz. Since its reopening, Roosevelt House has served 1,000 more students, formally educating and training them in fields for which FDR and Eleanor once pioneered, public policy and human rights. Under the leadership of the late Jack Rosenthal and now the wonderful Harold Holzer, as we approach the second quarter of the 21st century, its programs now touch on the flashpoint issues which Franklin and Eleanor could never have imagined. Yet, it can generally be said that Roosevelt House remains animated by a commitment that does not and will not change. The obligation to preserve the dignity of all men and women and to promote the ideal of public service in challenging times. What we now teach is what the Roosevelts once articulated and advocated with words on the wall behind us, freedom of speech and religion, freedom from want and fear, and the opportunity to learn, to grow, and to make the American dream come true. I mentioned a number of outstanding Hunter alumnae this evening, and I want to close with one more. Her name is Tamara Jean, Hunter class of 2018. She was an Eva Caston Grove scholar at Roosevelt House. Like so many earlier Hunter students, Tamara was the first in her family to go to college. Born to immigrant parents from Haiti, her father is a janitor at a Brooklyn synagogue. Tamara is, is the latest in a long line of graduates with similar life stories, but also unique, because this year she became the first in Hunter's history to win a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. Today, Tamara is pursuing her education at Oxford University, galvanized by her time at Roosevelt House. As you can see, this sacred and vibrant place continues to inspire students 75 years after the dedication, whose anniversary we celebrate tonight. And none of this could have been accomplished without the support of each and every one of you in this room. Rita, our great chair from whom you'll hear soon, our entire Roosevelt House Advisory Board, our, their names are in the program, our Hunter College Foundation and our wonderful chair, Kathy Weinroth, is here, and all of you, our generous supporters and friends. Hunter's motto is mihi cura futuri, the care of the future is mine. We live that motto every day, and with your support tonight, we reinvigorate this commitment to care for the future. Thank you for being here tonight and for helping to continue to make the American dream come true. Thank you. Thank you.